Good morning. Welcome to a morning prayer for Tuesday the 6th of October. It's lovely to be with you again this morning. Just give us a moment to uh, get set up and going. There we are, St Mary's Anvil. Marvellous. Oh, good morning. Hope everybody's doing okay this morning. It's not quite a wet morning, but it's not a not a glorious morning. But it's yeah, I do like autumn. It's uh, probably my favourite favourite season of the year. So it's quite nice when it's a bit cooler. Um, morning to everybody who's commenting. Right. Um, what are we doing this morning? I have to confess, it's been one of those mornings that. I just have just sat down in the office. I haven't had a chance to prep the readings or anything like that. So I'm making it up as I go along. It is Tuesday the 6th of October. It is uh, the day when we remember William Tyndale, uh, who was early Bible translator. I might talk a little bit about Bible translation in a minute then, because that's one of my favourite subjects. Um, so our psalm is Psalm 73. And our reading is from Acts 22, beginning at verse 22. So let's find those. Psalm 73. And morning prayer on Tuesday. Have one of those mornings in the rectory where The alarm didn't go off and there wasn't any food for packed lunches, so I had a sort of a frantic trip down to the co-op and, uh, and arguments with the boys and all of that sort of, you know, usual family life stuff, which is perfect preparation for leading morning prayer. Anyway, um, it's good to be with you. <laughs> didn't even have time to make a cup of tea, so I'm on the orange juice today. Terrible. Anyway, uh, morning prayer on Tuesday and... Um, Let's give ourselves a moment as we begin. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. So let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So our psalm this morning is Psalm... Uh, 73, Psalm 73, and the response is, In the Lord God have I made my refuge. In the Lord God have I made my refuge. Truly God is loving to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Nevertheless, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious of the proud. I saw the wicked in such prosperity, for they suffer no pains, and their bodies are sleek and sound. They come to no misfortune like other folk, nor are they plagued as others are. Therefore pride is their necklace, and violence wraps them like a cloak. Their iniquity comes from within, the conceit of their hearts overflow. In the Lord God have I made my refuge. They scoff and speak only of evil. They talk of oppression from on high. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue ranges round the earth. And so the people turn to them and find in them no fault. They say, how should God know? Is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the wicked, ever at ease they increase their wealth. Is it in vain that I cleansed my heart and washed my hands in innocence? All day long have I been stricken and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak as they do, I should have betrayed the generation of your children. Then thought I to understand this, but it was too hard for me until I entered the sanctuary of God and understood the end of the wicked, how you set them in slippery places, 
you cast them down to destruction. How suddenly do they come to destruction, perish and come to a fearful end. As with a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you arise, you will despise their image. When my heart became embittered, when I was pierced to the quick, I was but foolish and ignorant. I was like a brute beast in your presence. In the Lord God have I made my refuge. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me with glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing upon earth that I desire in comparison with you. Though my flesh and my heart fail me, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Truly those who forsake you will perish. You will put to silence the faithless who betray you. But it is good for me to draw near to God. In the Lord God have I made my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. In the Lord God I have made my refuge. Holy God, may we find wisdom in your presence and set our hope not on uncertain riches, but on the love that holds us to the end. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. It looks like the sun has come out and uh, washed, washed out the image. So I'm just going to close the curtain a minute. There we go. It's better. Well, you might think it's better not being able to see my face properly, actually, but um, we'll go with this for now. Um, so our reading is from Acts 22, um, beginning at verse 22. So this is entitled Paul and the Roman Tribune. Up to this point, they listened to Paul, but then they shouted, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And while they were shouting, throwing off their cloaks and, dis and tossing dust into the air, the tribune directed that he was to be brought into the barracks and ordered him to be examined by flogging to find out the reason for this outcry against him. But when they had tied him up with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who is uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? This man is a Roman citizen. The tribune came and asked Paul, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. The tribune answered, it cost me a large sum of money to get my citizenship. Paul said, But I was born a citizen. Immediately those who were about to examine him drew back from him, and the tribune also was afraid, for he realised that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. Since he wanted to find out what Paul was being accused of by the Jews, the next day he released him and ordered the chief priests and the entire council to meet. He brought Paul down and had him stand before them. While Paul was looking intently at the council, he said, Brothers, up to this day I have lived my life with a clear conscience before God. Then the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near him to strike him on the mouth. At this, Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting there to judge me according to the law, and yet in violation of the law you order me to be struck? Those standing nearby said, Did you dare to insult God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not realise it, brothers, that he was a high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a leader of your people. When Paul noticed that some were Sadducees and others were Pharisees, he called out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, son of Pharisees. I am on trial concerning the hope of resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dissension began between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadduce Sadducees say there is no resurrection or angel or spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge all three. Then a great clamour arose, and certain scribes of the Pharisees' group stood up and contended, We find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? When the dissension became violent, the tribune, fearing that they would te tear Paul to pieces, ordered the soldiers to go down, take him by force, and bring him into the barracks. That night the Lord stood near him and said, Keep up your courage. 
for just as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must bear witness also in Rome. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a fascinating little, well, another fascinating little uh, incident in in Paul's journey. Lots of uh, mixed up identities and uh, all of that sort of thing. I particularly like the moment where Paul's trying to get out of a scrape and he starts an argument between two of the groups of people there. That's a, a cunning way to do it. <coughs> so before we come on to the um, prayers, just say a few words about William Tyndale, who, whose feast day is today. So Tyndale was one of the first um, people to translate the Bible into English. Um, so I don't know how much you know about sort of the, the Bible and how it was written, but the majority of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew with smatterings of Aramaic and um, the majority of the New Testament was written in Greek. Um, and even though Jesus probably, well, he would have spoken a bit of Greek, but Aramaic was probably his, his sort of first language. Um, but it was written in Greek because that was the language, um, the sort of lingua franca, as it were, that, that everybody would speak. But like um, English is in a lot of the world or uh, Spanish is in large parts of the world or... Um, Chinese or Russian or whatever. One of the sort of common languages that even if people had their own sort of mother tongue, they would they would speak uh, Greek at the time. So it was written in Greek. Um, and then a few centuries later, it was translated into Latin. And the Latin translation, um, the Vulgate often became, well, sort of became the, the key translation that everybody used. And uh, particularly in sort of medieval period, that was used as a sort of power thing, because if people couldn't read the Bible, then they couldn't read the things about that... Um, those in authority didn't want them to read. Most people couldn't read at all. Um, so a lot of the stories were told through sort of stained glass windows and paintings and that sort of thing. Uh, but William Tyndale wanted to translate the Bible into English. He wasn't the, wasn't the first or the only person to do that, but he was one of the sort of key early people who translated the Bible into English. And it was very dangerous for him. He had to flee and hide, I think, in Belgium somewhere at one stage while he was doing it um, so that he didn't get sort of arrested and thrown into prison, a bit like Paul uh, in that New Testament reading. But he translated it into English um, and his his sort of phrase was that he wanted the boy at the plough to be able to hear the word of God. Um, so it was supposed to be in the language of the people, the language, the everyday language that people spoke. Um, so he translated it uh, into English, caught a lot of flack for doing so, but it eventually it sort of caught on this idea that we could speak, we could read God's word in our own language. And um, and so since then, there's obviously been lots and lots of different translations. King James was the first sort of a big translation, um, authorised version, as opposed to the unauthorised versions that sort of came beforehand. Um, but even now, we are incredibly fortunate, uh, those of us who speak English, because we can have the Bible in the language that we speak, and that not just in a sort of very formal language or old fashioned language, but in, in contemporary language, the, the everyday language of the boy at the plough. Not that there are many boys at ploughs anymore. Um, but there's an awful lot of uh, countries around the world that don't yet have the Bible in their own language. And translating the Bible into a language uh, does far more than just give them the word of God. Actually, for, for many languages, the Bible, the process of translating the Bible is a way of sort of protecting and preserving languages that may be quite fragile. They might not be spoken by very many people. Um, often languages aren't written down, so the Bible translators will help to, to write them down. In fact, um, Cyrillic, the uh, script, the Russian script, I was reading about that the other day, um, but that was um, sort of written down by, not by Cyril per se, but um, sort of by people in Cyril's, uh, sort of under Cyril's tutelage. Um, and so the, the Cyrillic script was written down as part of the process of translating the Bible. Um, and many languages have that, um, but a lot of places still don't have any parts of the Bible in their own language. Uh, there are far more um, Bible translations now than there were. But um, one of the big sort of Bible translating organisations is um, the Tyndale Bible Translators and um, so I think perhaps when we come on to pray later on, we can we can pray for those who translate the Bible into different languages. Um, but they'll also translate other documents, other texts, medical uh, books and children's books and that sort of thing. Um, because actually it's really important. And 
Bible translators will often tell of the joy that people have when they first hear God's words in their own language. That sense that God can speak to me uh, just as he speaks to other people around the world. It's something that we take for granted, but it's an incredible privilege that we can read God's words. So there we go. That's my little uh, sermonette on uh, on William Tyndale and on Bible translation. Um, so our uh, responsory for today. Open my eyes, O Lord, that I may see the wonders of your law. Open my eyes, O Lord, that I may see the wonders of your law. Lead me in the path of your commandments, that I may see the wonders of your law. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Open my eyes, O Lord, that I may see the wonders of your law. And so we come to pray. And uh, as usual, do share people, places, situations, all of the usual things for, for prayer in the comments. We come to you today, we bring our cares, our concerns. We know that you hear our prayers. We pray for those in care homes, those who are missing visits from family and friends. We pray for Enid and Bob, Sue and Sam, and Natalie. Vic, Tony, Kathleen, Mark and Jackie. We pray for Meg and Raphael, for Sue and Andrew and Kate and Archie and Maya. We pray for Mary and Graham. For Jill. We pray for Ruth. We pray for Jeff and Rachel and Ian. We pray for Sarah and Ben and Joanna. Pray for the work of Bible translators around the world. Pray for Tyndale, Nespiel, we pray for their work both in translating the Bible and in supporting communities, working with fragile people groups, bringing dignity to those who have often been oppressed for a very long time. One of the unseen ways in which your word brings justice and dignity. And we give you thanks for our ready access to your scriptures. May we value and appreciate that. For you all our prayers, knowing that you hear them, that you receive them, that you answer our prayers, not always how we would like or hope, 
we know that our prayers never go unanswered. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So the collect for the festival of William Tyndale. Lord, give to your people grace to hear and keep your word, that, after the example of your servant William Tyndale, we may not only profess your gospel, but also be ready to suffer and die for it, to the honour of your name, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So may the Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you all. It was uh, lovely to be with you again this morning. And... Um, Whatever the rest of the day holds for you, I hope it is a good and a blessed one. Take care.